This is a presentation of the University of Wisconsin Parkside. Well, thank you, Dean Walker, and thank you for organizing this wonderful series on uh, passion and engagement, which <laughs> I think fits really well with my feelings about this work. I'm passionately engaged. That was a wonderful introduction. I don't really feel like I have anything more to say, so thank you. And uh, okay, no, I guess I do have a few more things to say. Um, what I've got up here is my website on the Shakespeare Prison Project, which uh, you can access after the talk if you want to follow up and read more and learn more. It's, uh, the address is shakespeareprisonproject.com. I'm going to play a short video as a kind of icebreaker, just to give a feel for the project for those who may not be familiar with it, and then uh, we can pick up from there. The cry of murder rings out in the prison gym. The audience of about a hundred inmates watches as Rodrigo lies dead and Cassio, mortally wounded by the devious Iago, calls out for help. What ho, no what? The inmate actors in this production of Shakespeare's Othello are serving time for everything from drug trafficking to sexual assault. They've rehearsed their lines and practiced the choreographed swordplay for almost nine months. It's the second year in a row the Shakespeare Project has produced a play in the Racine prison. UW Parkside Communications professor Jonathan Shaler is the director. I've always been a Shakespeare fan. He's always moved me. I thought if I could bring that work into here and have the men connect with it, that they could, they could use Shakespeare as a way to express more of their own humanity. The tragedy of Othello, with its themes of racism, domestic violence, jealousy, and greed, also offer inmates ample opportunity to reflect on their own criminal behavior that landed them in prison. She's gone. I am abused, and my relief must be to loathe her. Thirty-five-year-old oh, Hyson Williams has been in prison for ten years. And we can call these delicate creatures ours, and not their appetites. Playing the role of Othello, a black man who marries a rich white woman, he says he had to work hard to tone down the jealous rage his character flies into when Iago tricks him into believing his wife has been unfaithful. I was drawn to the role. Initially, I'm thinking angry black man, and of course that's me all day long. I've always been confrontational, and a, a problem for me most of my life has been empathizing with other people. and using like theater and actually embracing other roles and I can grasp an understanding then of how other people might feel when I do something. I am, and anybody can, you can ask anybody, I am more caring now than I was when we even started the process. For Jeffrey Morarand, who plays Cassio, becoming an inmate actor has also helped him learn to empathize with the victims of his crimes. But he says the biggest challenge for him was a scene where he gets drunk and attacks a fellow officer and loses his rank as Othello's first lieutenant. A fellow comes to me and, and he says, I love you, but no more will you be an officer of mine. And it's just crushing. Oh, oh, oh. I have lost my reputation. I have lost that immortal part of myself and what remains uh, I, I've had some success on the outside uh, as a plumbing contractor and what have you. And of course, it's all smoke now, you know, it's gone. And so I can really relate in, in that part of it. But Cassio is redeemed at the end of the play, and Morarend finds hope in that for himself. He's commissioned as uh, the governor of Cyprus, and so I. I hope and pray that that same, you know, uh, second chance will uh, not only be given to me, but that I'll take correct advantage of it. to think, 
how they would think, how they're feeling, uh, the emotions they're feeling, uh, the hopes, the dreams, the aspirations. And I found so many times that what I was learning in group was the same thing that we were finding in our Shakespeare uh, class. When in disgrace and fortune and men's eyes, I alone beneath my outcast state, and trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries, and look upon myself and curse my fate, wishing me like to one more rich in hope, featured like him, like him with friends possessed, desiring this man's art and that man's school, with what I most enjoy content at least, yet in these thoughts myself almost despising, happily I think on thee. And then my state, like to the lark at breaking of day arising, from sullen earth sings hymns of at heaven's gate, for thy sweet love remembered such wealth brings, that then I scorn to change my state. So the title of this presentation is A Feeling of Their Afflictions, which comes from The Tempest. I'm going to share that passage with you momentarily. And then the subtitle is Empathy in a Prison Shakespeare Program. The intention of that video that I just showed you was to give you kind of a feel, kind of an overview of the experience. It's different every year, um, but also some of the, the hope that goes along with the experience. I think you probably got that feeling from the video that there's a lot of aspiration attached to the work. And the question is, does it actually result in, in benefits? Uh, we hope that it does, but does it? And this is where the research comes in. Where to begin? <laughs> there are many ways to measure the benefits of a Shakespeare prison program or any program. One of the least reliable is Recidivism rates, I think. Uh, when you contact people in corrections and ask them how recidivism rates are measured and whether they are correlated with specific programs, it gets very murky very quickly. So even perhaps those of us in, in higher education who would like to say that college classes promote uh, the kind of change that leads to reduced recidivism even there, we might have to acknowledge that these statistics are, are unreliable. I did manage to gather some statistics in the 2000, from the 2004 to 2008 period when we were first doing the program. And what I did was I looked at the annual reports of Racine Correctional Institution. It's a medium security prison for men in Sturdivant, Wisconsin. Uh, I think it's important to note that it is, like many prisons, um, well over capacity. The capacity of the prison is at about uh, is is made for about a thousand inmates, and there are sixteen hundred who are housed there. <clears throat> but what I've uh, got from their statistics was they have something called conduct reports. These are men who get in trouble for various violations while in prison, and there are minor conduct reports and major conduct reports. For a major conduct report, you get time in segregation or solitary, and the rate of Conduct reports overall in relation to the inmate population is one point, I could call up the statistic, but I believe it is 1.7. And if you compare that to the conduct reports for the men in the, in the Shakespeare project over that same four-year period, it is 0.07. There's a fraction of that number. So there, that is a, an interesting statistic. Now, Cause effect, you know, gets a little bit tricky, but it is suggestive. So that, that is one thing that I will point out. How do we measure it? What is empathy and how do we measure it? That becomes a really interesting question. Empathy is not even a concept that entered the English language until 1909. Uh, it was, it came from the German, and let me read this so I get it right. Uh, 
Ein Fung Lung. Ein meaning in and Fung Lung. Excuse my, uh, I know we have a German folks in the, in the audience. Could you help me with that pronunciation? Is that, is that pretty close? Einfühlung. Say again? Einfühlung. Einfühlung. Okay. The umlaut there on the, uh, on the first U. Okay. So it means something like into feeling would be a good translation. And that was brought into the uh, English in, uh, as I said, 1909. Uh, it came from German philosopher Rudolf Lotze. And uh, that was coined in, in 1858. The original use of the term, which is very interesting, is <clears throat> related to aesthetic appreciation, uh, under feeling into nature and feeling into to art. Uh, as as uh, Steven uh, Pinker explains, the feeling that one has in a, in a modern use of looking at a, a skyscraper, feeling tall uh, or diminished as you look at a skyscraper, but feeling into that experience. But it became, it became uh, gained a larger meaning, and by the 1940s in the United States, it had more to do with uh, human sympathy. It became associated with sympathy, and there are debates about the differences between, in the meaning, uh, the, the distinguishing characteristic, as we know, for empathy is that it means sharing the same feelings or resonating with the feelings of another, whereas sympathy is... Um, not quite as deep. It's about understanding and relating to the feelings, caring about the feelings of another, but not uh, actually feeling them. So I, I working working on a uh, working definition in order to be able to do the research, and I came up with this: empathy is the ability to step into another's perspective and to resonate with their feelings. And to amplify this, to give it a put it on a continuum, I added: it is the ability to understand, appreciate and value others' experiences, ideas, feelings, and needs. Okay. <clears throat> One thing that I've learned through my experience working with the Shakespeare Project is that we also need to take into account self-empathy, the ability to understand one's own perspective, feelings, and needs. The theory of mind, which is very um, current in, in psychological and sociological circles and right now, uh, states that in order to understand another person's interior life, we must be aware of our own, and that the, these two things are in some ways similar and in some ways different. <clears throat> so self-empathy seems to be related to empathy. You know, if you don't get yourself, then you can't get other people, is the idea. And in fact, one of the guys in um, our circle, we, we begin our process every evening with a circle, and we end with a circle brought this out when one of the guys complained and said, I don't understand, I, you know, I'm trying to be helpful, I'm trying to be a compassionate guy, I'm working in the servery, and people treat me like garbage. You know, I, I, I gave this guy some food, he said he would pay me back, and then I found out from another guy that uh, he's leaving tomorrow, so I'm not going to get paid back. And he had a million stories like that. <clears throat> And one of the other guys, somebody who's been in the program a long time, said, um, I think you're looking for something from the outside that you need to find inside. You need to understand yourself. You need to value yourself. You're not going to get it from that guy. And I thought that was a pretty profound uh, observation. So there's, there's some understanding uh, on the part of all of us, I think, that self-empathy is related to, to empathy. Other related terms, compassion. So what makes compassion different from empathy? That's when we move into action. Uh, that's often the way it's differentiated. Compassion is action based on empathy, action intended to alleviate another's suffering. And then if you want to go further, I know a clinical psychologist who uh, said, what about altruism? And I brought this into the, to the family of definitions. Well, altruism takes it a step further by identifying uh, the practice of disinterested and selfless concern for the well-being of others. What's really interesting to me is that we debate the meaning of empathy in our circle in the prison. This comes up. These, these ideas come up. And one thing that several of the men told me was that they believe that this is a specious distinction uh, between, uh, in other words, the attempt to separate self-concern or self-interest from other interest doesn't make sense to them and seems like a trick to get them to devalue themselves uh, or to, to uh, enforce compliance because um, 
why not value oneself? And, uh, and why, not, why can't that be integral to uh, being of service to others? In fact, uh, if we go back to that definition of empathy and self-empathy, the two do seem to go in hand. So some interesting ideas here. Did Shakespeare talk about empathy? The word hadn't been invented yet, but there's a famous passage from The Tempest, and I thought it, I would bring this out for our discussion. You may recall that The Tempest is about the Duke of Milan, who was betrayed by his brother, who was put on a rotten carcass of a butt with his daughter, and ended up on an island, surviving there with his daughter and working on his magic, developing his, his magical powers. When uh, his brother and the king, Alonso, uh, Gonzalo, his good old lord, and the others on the boat came by, it was just by chance. <laughs> uh, Prospero had an opportunity to wreak his revenge, so he created a storm brought them to the island and began to taunt them, one might say, with various trials. After a time, when his project had gathered to a head, Ariel, his fiery spirit, came to him and, and gave him a report on what was going on. And Ariel says, um, well, first Prospero says, say my spirit, how fares the king and his followers? And Ariel says, confined together in the same fashion as you gave in charge, just as you left them, all prisoners, sir in the line grove which weather fends your cell. They cannot budge till your release. The king, his brother and yours, abide all three distracted, and the remainder mourning over them, <clears throat> brimful of sorrow and dismay. But chiefly, him that you termed, sir, the good old Lord Gonzalo. His tears run down his beard like winter's drops from eaves of reeds. Your charm so strongly works him that if you now beheld them, your affections would become tender. And Prospero says, Dost thou think so, spirit? Ariel responds, Mine would, sir, if I were human. Prospero has a realization. He says, And mine shall. Hast thou, which are but air, a touch, a feeling of their afflictions, and shall not myself, one of their kind, that relish all as sharply, Passion is they, be kindlier moved than thou art. Though with their high wrongs I am struck to the quick, yet with my nobler reason, gainst my fury, do I take part. The rarer action is in virtue than in vengeance. They being penitent, the sole drift of my purpose doth extend not a frown further. Go, release them, Ariel. My charms I'll break, their senses I'll restore, and they shall be themselves. When that passage is read, often that last line, I think, is left out or not discussed, but I love that last line, they shall be themselves. There's something about empathy, I think, that involves honoring the other human being as they are, rather than as an object of our own ends. So I think there, you know, there's, even though it's not in the Columbia Dictionary of uh, Shakespeare quotations, the word empathy doesn't appear because it hadn't been invented yet. Uh, there are certainly acts of empathy in the plays. I'm skirting around the issue here, but beginning to own, hone in on it. How might we measure empathy or whether or not it's occurring in a Shakespeare project? It would probably help to know a little bit more about how the whole thing is structured. It began as a nine-month process where uh, prisoners would be introduced to a play, study the play over the nine-month process, learn to act, many of them for the first time, memorize their lines, produce the play. All along the way, keeping a journal, reflecting on their experiences, and engaging in dialogue about the meaning of the characters, the plot, the themes in the play. Then they would perform it for two inmate audiences and one public audience, which would include sometimes members of the campus community. Some of the people here have been to these plays, and uh, also members of the inmates' families and people on their visiting list. Very emotional experiences sometime, uh, which I'll, I'll, I'll mention uh, a bit later. So that was the basic model. Now we've expanded it. 
so that it's a 12-month <laughs> program. And after the performance in May, by the way, we meet twice a week, uh, every Tuesday night and every Thursday night, uh, 6 to 8.30 p.m. Um, <clears throat> during the, the summer from May to August now, we started this last year with Hamlet. The inmates reflect on themes from the play as it relates to their own lives. And they develop a play based on their personal stories. And that's produced in August. And then they're done, unless they want to continue uh, another year. But that's the basic model. So a lot of interesting things happen. What I've noticed in my own program, and as well as the other 13 programs across the United States that I've studied, is that there are three themes that emerge again and again and again. I want to introduce those to you. I believe that's my next slide. There's the question. Before I get to those themes, just to reference this slide, the prisoners chose in the first year the Muddy Flower Theater Troupe as their title. They were thinking of other things like the, the Prairie Players. Uh, <clears throat> I'm forgetting the other titles right now, but Muddy Flower is the one that, that stuck. One of the guys who was a Buddhist said, why, talked about, to us about the Lotus Flower and said that this is a flower that grows from the muddy depths, but it's a beautiful thing, and that we were doing something like that. And the guys liked that, so, so it stuck, and that's, that's the title that we have. I think it does uh, resonate well. <clears throat> so to move on, sanctuary is the first thing that most prison theater programs have in common. What do we mean by sanctuary? Prisons are very hostile places. Um, <clears throat> I know one prison theater facilitator who went in th into therapy uh, just because he had to go into prisons on a regular basis uh, and he had to detox in some way and that was his his way of detoxing. <clears throat> the, uh, there's, it's just a really hard place to be as, as prisons are supposed to be I suppose in, in our model of criminal justice. Um, <clears throat> but the classroom and in this case, the library where we rehearsed for the first four years, we now, re we, uh, we now rehearse in a classroom, is a sanctuary in that the men can open up, they, they can be vulnerable, they can talk about their feelings, they can explore ideas, they can take risks, they can laugh, they can cry. This is not behavior that is uh, accepted or even conceived of as a possibility in, in most areas of the institution. Just to give you two quick examples of the contrast between the sanctuary of the performance area and the rest of the institution. One uh, a long time ago, one very recent. Uh, when we did The Tempest, Nick, one of our guys, played the role of Ferdinand and he, he did a beautiful job with the role. It was a tremendously emotional experience. He had opened up in ways that he hadn't opened up for a long time and so he was very vulnerable, very tender. And on the night of our public performance, he was really shaky. He was about to see his daughter, who he hadn't seen for years. Um, she was born when he was uh, incarcerated. I think she was about seven at this point. And he sat alone in a corner and just began weeping. Uh, and an officer saw him there and mocked him for, for crying. What's, what's wrong with you? What's your problem? That kind of thing. Um, I'm, I don't, I'm not here to smash officers, by the way. There are good ones. <laughs> um, and the guys tell me about that. But I'm, I'm talking about the overall in institutional environment and the mood of the place. The other thing that happened just the other day was uh, we had ended a rehearsal and a guy, David, who's playing Puck in A Midsummer Night's Dream, uh, has all kinds of issues, as we all do. <laughs> um, he, he doesn't really think that he has a voice. He doesn't think that people value his voice. He, that's why he talks so fast. That's why he puts himself down. That's why he doesn't look people in the eye. But that evening, he had sat up straighter, and he had started looking people in the eye. And one person whose respect he especially wanted, and I believe that, that people's roles choose them somehow in the casting. It's just uncanny how it happens sometimes. If you know the play Midsummer Night's Dream, Puck, is uh, the assistant to Oberon. And there's, there's kind of a mentoring relationship there. <clears throat> and, and Puck really desires to please Oberon. Well, our Oberon is a towering, uh, 
highly respected guy, very intelligent, and I know that this guy, David, wants the respect of that other actor. <laughs> and that evening, they, they had come to a place where they, that respect was being demonstrated. And so it was just a good vibe. And I was walking out with David, and I stopped at the front desk to, to talk to the officer about a technical problem in the classroom. And David was standing there, you know, squ his shoulders squared, uh, good look on his face. And uh, we were about to go outside because I walk through the yard and, and sometimes the uh, prisoners go with me and then I take a different route, obviously, to get out. But um, David picked up his orange woolly and started to put it on as we were talking. And the officer broke mid-sentence with me and looked at him and said, hey, cap off. And at that, just that little moment, he wilted, he just shrunk. And his voice became shaking and he said, that wasn't necessary. Just like that. And, and when I walked out with him, he was ranting. He was obsessed with what had just happened. Now that, that speaks to a lot of things, but this is what I mean by a sanctuary. It's not um, a cure, but it's a place where people can begin to explore more of their own humanity. A second uh, <clears throat> claim that I make for prison theater programs and the Shakespeare Project is that it's a crucible for personal transformation. This is a picture of Robert who played Cornwall in King Lear. And um, to me, that picture <laughs> is the transformation. Um, you've, uh, people are ra racially self-segregate often in prisons. So just the fact that these two men are embracing is, is a beautiful picture to me. But also, I never saw Robert smile for, for nine months. I never saw that look on his face. Uh, but I saw it by the time we got to our performance, and that's just after our performance they're celebrating. Robert is uh, a Vietnam vet with what uh, he tells us, told me, w was 100% PTSD. And I'm not sure that's an official diagnosis, but that's how he put it. And I remember early in the process uh, when I was blocking him, I can't imagine why or a Vietnam vet, or how, I should say how a Vietnam vet with uh, very serious PTSD issues would be playing the role of Cornwall and gouging out Gloucester's eyes. Uh, it was a very difficult uh, thing to manage, but we did, and, and he found ways to cope with it in, in some ways by making light of it, like um, bringing in um, <clears throat> roll-on deodorant balls that he had pried loose and making those the eyeballs and letting them roll along the floor. <clears throat> but during one rehearsal, he, uh, I was blocking him, and it was an intricate blocking, and he snapped on me. He said, uh, what? It's going to be different again? It's different all the time. What are you doing? This is ridiculous. And he just went into a thing. Um, and then uh, a little bit later, he talked to me, and that's when I f found out about his PTSD. He hadn't, he hadn't mentioned it to me before. And uh, we worked through that. It, it wasn't a, a huge deal. But just to see this uh, is suggestive to me of, of the kinds of transformation that can happen. And then the third thing is a rehearsal for reintegration. I mentioned the guy who cried. This is him, Nick, and this is his daughter. When she saw him perform as Ferdinand, remember she hadn't seen him in years. She's seven, and um, she'd never seen him out of his prison greens. We, we were allowed to wear costumes that year. Uh, we're still allowed to wear costume pieces, but that year we were allowed to wear full costumes, and that costume was built just for him. Uh, <clears throat> At the end of the performance, uh, she ran up and, and embraced him, and um, we asked him, her, you know, what did you think of your dad's performance? And she said, my dad's a prince. <laughs> that was, that's all she needed to say. But in what way is it a rehearsal for reintegration? I want to say something bigger about that. That's a nice emotional moment. But what I mean by a rehearsal for reintegration is the chance to do something of value, to give something to the community because anybody who does theater seriously for a living uh, or values theater knows that that's a gift <laughs> to the community and to have outsiders, people from uh, the community that they know and that they don't know, sit there and, and receive the play and, and acknowledge and value this contribution and the work that the, the men have done on the play is a rehearsal for reintegration because it's a, it's a message to the men in the group that they can work hard, create something of value, and, and make it a kind of contribution, and be recognized and valued for that contribution. And the, believe me, there's a lot of nervousness and a lot of uh, 
anxiety about looking people in the eye uh, when, they, when they come in to see the show at first? I want to mention a connection to another line of research. Uh, in 2001, Shad Maruna published a study on the Liverpool desistance data, which was about ex-convicts and how they had um, the ones who were expected to go back into prison, but did not, he found, had developed a story of self in which they saw themselves as people who had acknowledged their past uh, deeds, who saw themselves in a process of transition, and who saw themselves as able to contrib contribute something positive to the community. And this, this research uh, has been acknowledged by the American Criminological uh, Association, and in 2001 received, I think, uh, the award for best new research. So it's got a lot of traction and, and credibility. And I think that's one thing that we do also in the Shakespeare Project, through their narrative writing, through their autobiographical writing, in, the, in their journals, what they're doing is they're tracking their own progress in the work and telling stories about it. And I'll, I'll give you an example. Some of that is in the form of poetry. This one is by Travail, who you saw earlier leaning against the poster that said, uh, impossible is nothing, the, the Muhammad Ali poster. He started our production of, of Lear with this. Secret lives are brought, secret fears are brought to life on stage. My life is in a rage, and to write my life, one page is not enough, but if I had one mic, I might be able to escape this cage, so I live vicariously through my nocturnal dreams. I can bring Shakespeare to life through my high beams, reinvent Nietzsche, and sell a leprechaun the color green, get real with Khalil to understand love, see me above riding high on broken wings. I mean, I am not the first who has incurred the worst, but I have concurred with those who have opposed my life's worth cried when I rode shotgun in the back of my own mind, act one, scene five, on my own stage, in my very own play, where night might not turn into day, might not return to the essence. Capability is born from vulnerability, where my hostility was vented. I have been hospitably kented. No disrespect intended, but I have been bent on hell ever since I sipped that first sip. I can't speak because it's this thing called pain that drips from my lips. They label me violent because I stay bottled up and silent, and although my life is like a raging sea, my heart's still soft, like a violet. No life. No life is quiet. Stop complaining, you say, but I can't because I'm trapped on the stage of life's lies. And I ask you, why brand they us with base? With baseness. Bastardy. Base. Base. Uh, so that was Travail's poem. <clears throat> I wanted to share another story. This is Cordelia. <laughs> and from that PMLA article, I wanted to uh, share his short story with you. Gary writes that he's been in trouble with the law since he was five years old. He was taken into the care of the state at age seven and a half. My mother has said so many times that my life is a waste. I should never have been born. I should have been the for sure abortion. His crimes, which have ranged in severity, have included a fair amount of drug abuse. At the time I met him, he was nearing the end of his fourth incarceration. As was true for the other members of the cast, one of Gary's opportunities for growth came in his developing relation to his character. Early in the rehearsal process, I worked with Gary to help him access feelings appropriate to Cordelia's emotional confrontation with her father in Act One, Scene One. How many, I'm just curious, how many p people are familiar with this scene? A few? I'll remind you or, or introduce it to people who don't know. This is uh, an elderly king, maybe 80, who's uh, about to retire, a little abrupt. His daughters didn't expect it. He's uh, going to give away the kingdom. He's going to split it among his three daughters. But he's going to play a game with them first, and the game is, uh, tell me how much you love me, and then I'll give you a, a really good share. 
and you know you might get the biggest share if you tell me but we can see that uh, he's really leaning towards Cordelia that she's the favorite he saves her for last and he, he wants her to have the biggest share but she's got to play the game <clears throat> and so the lines go something like this he says and now uh, our joy, although our last, not least, to whose young love the vines of France and milk of Burgundy strive to be interest. What can you say to draw a third more opulent than your sister's? And she says, nothing, my lord. She's stuck. What's she supposed to do? See, she really loves him, and she doesn't want to play this game. She, nothing, my lord. He says, nothing? She says, nothing? He says, nothing will come of nothing. Speak again. She says, unhappy that I am, I, I cannot heave my heart into my mouth. I love your majesty according to my bond, no more nor less. How, how, Cordelia, mend your speech a little, lest you may mar your fortunes. Good my lord, you have begot me, bred me, loved me. I return those duties back as a right fit, obey you, love you, and most honor you. Why have my sister's husbands if they say they love you all? Haply, when I shall wed, that lord whose hand shall take my flight shall carry half my love with him, half my care and, and, and duty. Sure, I shall never marry like my sisters to love my father all. But goes thy heart with this. I, my good lord, so young and so untender, so young, my lord, and true, let it be so. Thy truth, then, be thy dower. For by the sacred radiance of the sun, the mysteries of Hecate and the night, by all the operation of the orbs from whom thou do exist and cease to be, here I disclaim all my paternal care, propinquity and property of blood, and as a stranger to my heart and me, hold thee from this forever. He disowns her. Pretty tough stuff. Well, this is what Gary had to say about it. I asked Gary to think of an important relationship and situation in his own life where he did not feel properly seen, heard, or understood. Then I asked him to physically arrange Lear and the other characters so that our positions would better express his feelings about that real-life relationship and situation. This is something that I didn't realize at the time, uh, but the Feast of St. Crispian does in Milwaukee with uh, veterans. They do similar type of work where behind the security of the mask of the role, one can revisit deep issues, uh, even trauma in one's own life, and address it. <clears throat> so Gary did this, and we ran the scene several times. He's just, remember, he's doing this non-verbally. He's not sharing anything other than the lines and, and moving us around physically. But he did write in his journal later, in the safety of his journal, he wrote, it felt like a 50-50 roll of the dice. But given a moment and a few run-throughs, I just let what I feel daily edge the surface. Tears of pain that swamp me from knowing that things are all messed up with my life. <clears throat> Gary speaking, now this is me talking about the moment of interaction. Speaking as Cordelia heaved his shoulders as he took in more oxygen and his eyes riveted on mine, filled with tears. Later he would reflect on this experience as, and again from his journal, the purest of emotional therapy. I am Cordelia in so many ways, and in being her, I am learning me. In being her, I am learning me. As if to demonstrate this symbiotic relationship between himself and his character, Gary appropriated Cordelia's voice to proclaim a new intention. He wrote, I beseech you, prison. With washed eyes, I see you for what you are. Let this man change. Let this ID number fall. Gary has come and will not bow any longer. That's story one. I'll check my time, see if we have time for story two, because I really want a discussion. It's getting late. So I don't think we need the other story. <laughs> <clears throat> I, I just want to wrap this up by talking a little bit more about my plan for the research and then get uh, your... your your comments and questions. So I'm working with two undergraduate students this semester. I have authorization from the Department of Corrections and from the university and from the men who've signed release forms and all of them have to conduct research this year on this question and, and other issues, but this question is the focal point. And I, I was 
talking with my students just this week about how can we really get at this? You know, we're all around it, but how can we really get at? We have these stories, but how can we really track whether or not something like empathy is occurring? And how can we be clear conceptually about it is also important. And then um, how can we measure it? And it came up in our discussion. This is why it's good to work on a research team, not alone. I'm, I'm not sure I would have arrived at this so easily uh, alone. But we came up with the idea that uh, the prisoners should be co-researchers, that there shouldn't be any pretense to uh, objectivity and that we should tell them what we're doing and ask them to help us clarify the concept and ask them to notice how and if and when it's happening and to document it themselves. So that's what we're doing. And we're just getting started, so I don't have that data for you. So obviously, I'm going to have to come back and give another talk <laughs> or, or write an article or something. But uh, definitely write an article. <clears throat> But that's where we are with the, with the plan. And the last thing I want to say is in terms of the complexity of the concept, I've just been reading Stephen uh, Pinkner's book, fantastic book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, Why Violence Has Declined, Harvard uh, psychology professor. And uh, whoo, man, this book. <laughs> well, he, he deals with empathy in some depth, and he really problematizes the, the concept and uh, challenges it. And what I'm getting so far from, from my understanding of what he's, his argument is that uh, it's too simple to, to accept de empathy as we normally do, that there's a downside to empathy. And he gives an example of somebody who um, works at a social service and sees somebody who's 20 uh, people into the line and learns their story and feels empathy for them and so moves them to the front of the line. How do we know that the 19 in front don't have more urgent situations? We don't. Um, so there's a limit or there's a, a possible downside to empathy. That's a very simplistic formulation, but it's a, you know, good, good to trouble the concept. <clears throat> Pickner argues that sympathy might be uh, a safer, more balanced approach in, in everyday life, and also that the principle of fairness uh, needs to be taken into account. <clears throat> and I think about the way we teach, or the way I teach communication competence in the communication uh, classes, and it's always about balancing and taking into account the needs of self, other, and situation, all, always all three. It's not as simple as feeling sorry for somebody and leaping to their, to their aid, although that may be the thing to do. <clears throat> taking into account the needs of self, other, and situations. So I think um, we just need to keep that in mind as we do this research.